Uh, he kind of made up some words for the title of his presentation that aren't really in the dictionary, so I'm going to let him actually tell you what it says. Uh, so, Stephen. Okay. Uh, thanks, Leo, for pointing out that productionalizing isn't a word. Um, so, the title of my talk is Productionalizing Cloud Workflows at Scale with Push to Compute. Um, I actually picked the word productionalizing on purpose because I think that there, there has traditionally been a line uh, drawn between uh, kind of dev test, uh, system administration, and software development. Uh, but now, as, as software development uh, and, and developer velocity is increasing, um, those lines are becoming blurred. So developers are now responsible many times for uh, kind of determining what environment their software runs in, um, and now even shipping the environment uh, as a dev test environment. But even taking that a step further, uh, letting developers actually uh, declare and specify and ship the environment that should be run in production. And that's a lot about what Push to Compute is about. Um, so one quick thing, if you want to follow along with these slides, uh, you can get them on your phone or on your laptop, nimix.github.io slash india17-slides. Um, they're responsive, so it should, should appear uh, relatively well on your phone as well. So um, this, uh, this talk is going to be about deploying serverless workflows. Uh, what is a serverless workflow exactly, and what's the purpose of it? We want to allow users, end users, uh, possibly not even uh, uh, developers or um, users who are familiar with uh, code or, or command lines, we want to allow them to consume applications in an opinionated way without provisioning servers. So we don't want users to have to go and stand up a server just so that they can run your really cool software program. We want them just to run your really cool software program, just like double clicking on their desktop um, on their local machine. So in the cloud, um, we need better tools for that. Push to compute is on the other side of the coin. We need to enable developers to deploy applications as opinionated workflows for those users to consume. So we want to kind of cut out the system administration responsibilities that stand between uh, developer and end user, which really is just a barrier, a market barrier for users and for developers to get their code to, to solve real problems. So some of the benefits of push to compute uh, that we'll go over today um, and that are really important. Um, push to compute can be used as a CI, CD service. Um, so basically you can make changes to your code or make changes to the environment, uh, build them, and then deploy them uh, with basically a git push. Um, push to compute also helps maintain developer velocity. Uh, it, and to that end, uh, we want developers to ship complete environments, not just an installer that hopefully the end user has the right version of the operating system and their sysadmin allows these dependencies to be installed because they don't conflict with any other software that happens to be on that server. Um, and also, we want to reduce support overhead, uh, not just for developers, because uh, supporting software um, in the wild is pretty complex. Um, we want to reduce support overhead for software vendors as a whole. Um, so we don't want a support tech to have to be on every call whenever there's a report of an issue when a, 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 an end user is just trying to use the application. And finally, um, push to compute also allows for declarative application versioning. And that's really important in the world of Git where we can uh, kind of version our work in a, in a very declarative way. We can kind of describe how we want the environment to be in a, in a text file. Um, it helps us version the software in a much more robust way rather than just having uh, uh, kind of different dependencies and different versions of packages. Maybe the, maybe the system is upgraded, operating system is upgraded. Well, in a container, you can control all of that. And that's what Jarvis is about. So what is push to compute exactly? It's a way to package, deploy, and release software on Jarvis. And Jarvis is a... Uh, a supercomputer in the cloud, but it's also a very usable, user-friendly supercomputer in the cloud. So push to compute is all about packaging your application environment, operating system, configuration, using Docker, Git, and JSON, which are pretty familiar tools. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Docker or Git or JSON, 
Um, these are actually very easy things to pick up. So um, please don't be afraid of uh, learning Docker. If you can write a shell script, you can write a Docker file. Um, Git, um, you can use in a very, sim uh, very simple way. There's a lot of uh, power inside of Git, but it's not very uh, hard to get started. And JSON uh, is a very human readable format. Um, it's also very useful uh, to use programmatically as well as Python. Um, then we actually want to take this environment and build it into a, a, a real working environment, which is basically taking the Docker file and building it. So we want to be able to deploy those opinionated workflows using Docker, and we build them using the push to compute build service. And then finally, we actually want to release applications because um, as many of the talks have talked about today, um, code is, is, is cool and we all like writing code, but really at the end of the day, it matters a lot what your code actually does, what, what problems is it solving, what value is it adding to the business. So push to compute is a way to deploy applications to end users. And this is a very high level overview of uh, the workshop that we'll go through today. So uh, on the bottom left, there's a uh, push to compute workflow definition. Um, those are all the text files that describe what the environment is going to be. So that, that would be the operating system if you want Ubuntu or CentOS, Ubuntu 1404, 1604. Um, a make file, um, I, I usually include a make file just to, to kind of automate my local building. Um, and then the NAE directory. NAE stands for Mimix Application Environment. And this is where application metadata is stored inside of this folder. So there's an appdev.json names the application, it, it tells you how to run the application, it builds a simple UI for the user. And then uh, a couple of other things like a screenshot, which is how it'll, the, how it'll be shown on our catalog. Um, you can put appdef.png, which is an icon. And these are, these are kind of things that turn your application into a real product. And that, that goes back to the productionalizing, where you're kind of taking a very simple dev test approach, but turning it into a product and productionalizing. And uh, once you have the files, you can store them in a Git repository, version them. It, it could be any repository, really. Um, build it with Docker Hub. Nimix also has a build service, uh, which builds Docker images for both Intel and Power Machines. Um, to my knowledge, it's the, the only uh, build service for Power Docker containers uh, in the public cloud. Um, and then finally, we deploy those applications and import the Docker image uh, to run with the Jarvis container runtime, which is our proprietary container runtime. So what is the workflow exactly? Um, this is really important for developers to understand. Um, how to turn an application into a workflow. Um, a workflow is a combination of an application, which is its operating system. So that's what does the application need to run in? Ubuntu, CentOS, kind of any of these uh, operating system uh, user space personalities. Um, the environment, so any uh, environment variables that need to be set, dependencies, packages uh, that, that are required, and then uh, finally application binaries, uh, which is your code, essentially. Um, and then the action of the workflow. So if you have uh, a set of algorithms that do 10 different things, the action is actually doing one thing. You pick one solver and you tell the user, Okay, if you want to run a, a CFD solution, uh, do it in this particular way. Um, and then the hardware it runs on. So your, your uh, software might be able to use GPUs if they're available, might be able to use FPGAs, might even be able to use uh, uh, IBM Power or CAPI. Um, and it's really cool to think about software being independent of the hardware and being able to run it on whatever hardware the user actually decides at runtime. And then finally, the input data. Uh, that's been a topic that's been discussed a lot today. Ingesting data is a very hard problem uh, because it's growing so fast. Uh, but at the end of the day, the user just wants to se select the data and run the application. The user doesn't care about all the complexities of getting that data there if the application handles that itself. And then finally, the output data, which is what the user is really hoping for. That's the value add to the user. So some examples of workflows. Uh, this is a screenshot of our application catalog. Um, you can see here about uh, uh, 20 or so, 24 applications uh, in our catalog uh, on this screenshot alone. Um, these are interactive applications that would run on a remote desktop. 
uh, solvers, uh, uh, kind of CFD applications, rendering applications, lots of machine learning applications, lots of different types of workflows. So some examples of workflows, uh, one would be to launch a cluster of NVIDIA P100 machines uh, and run Kinetica's real-time analytics uh, GPU database. Another, that's basically a web service uh, that spins up, but it's powered by a cluster of uh, GPU machines. Uh, it also requires a uh, parallel file or a distributed file system, kind of like uh, HDFS. Um, another uh, application workflow would be to uh, run NVIDIA Digits, which is a web application for a uh, very simple uh, kind of uh, user interface for some of the complex deep learning algorithms. Uh, you might want to run it on a NVIDIA DGX1, K80s, lots of different machine types to choose from. Let the user decide based on their, their input requirements. Some others are to configure a model for parameter, parameterized aerodynamic simulation. Configuring a model is just a very simple uh, GUI. So users might just be rotating a model, clicking, dragging, adding some parameters, setting it up for a larger solve. They don't need a supercomputer to do some simple preprocessing. That's a workflow. Uh, so you might want to guide the user to use the smallest machine type possible uh, for that type of work. Um, then they might want to run it on a cluster of 1,000 cores or 2,000 cores. Um, other workflows uh, include uh, running an algorithm in MATLAB with the GPU for a few hours. But then once they're done, you want to close that down and review the results. Review the results on a smaller machine type. And uh, deep learning. So you, you might want to train on 20 gigabytes of input data or 500 gigabytes of input data on the newest GPU machine type or 10 terabytes. You know, we, have, we have users every day are asking for more and more and more uh, uh, compute and data solutions. Uh, these are workflows. And some applications might not support a, a uh, uh, you know, some applications might not be designed to support large scale. So you might want to, prevent users from trying to run on, on too many machines if it doesn't support that. Or vice versa, you might want to prevent them from running on too few machines. Um, another workflow would be an API-based application where you want the user to be able to determine, oh, do you want to run it on 100 cores, 1,000 cores, 10,000 cores? Just let the user decide, configure your application, ship it in a way that the users can just drag a slider and select how many mach machines that they want to run it on. So some common workflow architectures uh, that we've found, um, one is batch, run a single parameterized command, and then exit. So basically, you know, run a batch command. Um, desktop interactive is essentially a remote desktop application. So in the cloud, we have uh, some batteries included Docker images, where we have the Nimix desktop. You just launch a, a remote visualization application. We have a VNC connection directly in the browser. Um, and then when you're done, you just close the application and the billing meter stops. Um, web Interactive would be a single tenant web application. So if you're concerned about data sovereignty, about uh, security, you can actually make a single tenant web application. So users can spin this up on demand, pay for only the machine time that they're using while they're running that application, then close it down. And it's actually very, very secure because uh, there's no, uh, no uh, multi-tenant data in the application. Um, and the application is only running for a finite amount of time. There's a new password every time. Uh, different things like that can add to kind of the, the value add, the security value add of, uh, of an application. Um, a developer environment would be uh, maybe the latest machine learning framework available for uh, developers to SSH into a machine and kind of kick the tires, run some experiments, maybe run some Python scripts, see how things are going. Maybe add some additional dependencies, pull them in. But it's ephemeral, so once they're done, they close down the machine, uh, they close down the job, and uh, if they want to run that again, they can get exactly the right setup again every time they run the job. And that's really cool, that's really powerful. Um, and then finally, a service would be like a web service uh, that runs indefinitely. Um, maybe your, your web service needs uh, GPUs, and it's just constantly making requests, or you're constantly getting requests uh, that need GPUs. Uh, so that would be another type of, of workflow. So let's get to the good stuff. Uh, we're going to have a, a quick tutorial uh, on how to build a simple application. Um, so the objective today is just to build a workflow with two commands. Um, actually, we'll have uh, four at the end. 
Um, so we'll have four different commands. That's twice as many as I've laid out here. Um, a batch endpoint to stylize an image. So you can see the image on the left is uh, Jarvis uh, standing on the Trinity River when it was flooded a couple years ago. And um, then on the right is kind of Jarvis stylized as Starry Night. So this uses an open source uh, implementation of uh, neural style uh, implemented in Torch. It's available on GitHub. Uh, this, I believe, is a student at Stanford, uh, JC Johnson. Um, so you can check out the software and kind of look through um, the installation instructions. So installing software is really not that interesting, uh, especially if you do it over and over again. Um, if, you, if you look at the installation instructions, uh, there's really nothing uh, uh, kind of mind-blowing there. It's just install these packages, make sure to use the right operating system, and then uh, once you have everything set up just right, then run this command. So that's essentially uh, what the installation instructions will uh, state here. Um, so we're going to do just that, and once we've done it, we're never going to have to install it again. We can just uh, run the application and we can even release it on Jarvis and allow any of our team members to run the application or allow any of our customers to run the application without any further installation. And then after that, we're gonna build a simple remote desktop application that just displays the image in an open source package called Pinto, which is a, kind of like Microsoft Paint uh, in the open source world. So the prerequisites um, to follow this tutorial would be a Jarvis account, um, a Docker Hub account, and a GitHub account. And if you only have a Jarvis account, you can get pretty far through the tutorial. But to do the complete tutorial, you'll need a Docker Hub and a GitHub account. So step one, uh, hello Jarvis. Uh, so we'll pull an image from Docker Hub and run it on Jarvis with the default app dev. The default app dev uh, just defines some very basic workflows uh, that can kind of get you started. Um, so a batch workflow, uh, a server workflow, and uh, a GUI workflow. So the way we do this is first we go to mc.jarvis.com. MC stands for Material Compute, uh, which influences the, uh, uh, the design of Material Compute. So I'll log in here. And right away it's taking me to the Push to Compute page because that's where I've uh, been logged into. Um, there are a couple of tabs over here, Compute, Dashboard and push to compute are the, the three main ones that you'll probably use. Um, if you navigate to push to compute, uh, this is where you can create applications, create your own applications. And every user has access to push to compute. So um, click on new to create a new application. And then just to pull uh, a Docker repository, um, we'll put in one of our Nimbix base images to start out with. Nimbix. Ubuntu desktop, trusty, and click OK. Uh, I forgot to give an app ID, so this is Ubuntu 14.04 base. And now you can see this is the new application icon. And uh, just to give you a sense of what we're going for, um, when we create an application, this is our application catalog. So you're actually creating an application that can be released into our application catalog, which is kind of like our, our app store for supercomputing. So back to the push to compute page, we need to pull the base image. We need to pull the image from Docker Hub. You can pull from any Docker registry, um, but Nimbix uh, uses Docker Hub for a lot of our, our base images. And you can inherit from these images as kind of a starting point uh, when you deploy applications on Jarvis. So now that the image is pulling, we can monitor its progress through history. And you can see pull is started, uh, scheduled and started. So it's pulling the image now, and then it's going to import it into the Jarvis container runtime. So once it's ready, we'll have this one, uh, base NDS. 17 image, I've, I've pulled it in advance. It takes a, a minute or two to pull the image. And we'll have uh, three options down here, batch, server, and GUI. These are commands that guide the user to 
uh, run a specific workflow so that they can't just do anything. They, they do what the developer wants the user to do. Um, and this, this screenshot here is customizable as well as part of the application metadata. So our first command is going to be hello Jarvis. So we type echo hello Jarvis, and this is just going to run a simple batch command and echo the standard output to the Java. You can see here there are a lot of different options in the workflow builder. Uh, there's a machine type, so Nimix has many different machine types, but it doesn't really make sense to run echo hello Jarvis on a GPU. So you can actually restrict these machine types in the application definition. <coughs> so now we've run a very simple workflow on Jarvis, a very simple batch workflow. You can run other commands. Uh, there's some uh, specification of the environment. So if you run a multi-node um, cluster, you might want to know what are the host names of the machines in your cluster. So those are available in, in these files, Etsy Jarvis nodes or Etsy Jarvis cores. There's also some application uh, runtime metadata that's stored in job info. So you can source this file and get, for example, a job name, which is a unique ID identifier for your job. So if you need to uh, kind of reference the output data uh, based on the job name, you can use that information there as well. So you can also try running the server uh, and connecting to the Nimix uh, desktop. So let's try um, connecting to the Nimix desktop now. And this is like doing a full boot of a container. Uh, kind of like booting a server. And this is all running on bare metal, uh, so if you're interested in, in uh, kind of studying the differences between virtualized versus bare metal uh, runtimes versus uh, different operating systems, uh, in a container it's basically just running a command. So uh, you don't have all the additional services running inside of the container. So now um, this container starts SSH, so you can SSH into this public host name. And this is uh, set by the interactive flag in the app dev. And uh, this, so this image doesn't have uh, the, the desktop running right now, but in, uh, in the next step, we'll pull an image that has the Nimix desktop and we'll connect to an interactive uh, remote desktop command. So to kill a job uh, or shut it down, just click the power button. And that'll gracefully terminate your, your image. So the next step, um, pulling uh, Docker images from Docker Hub is great, but sometimes you need to customize them. Uh, or you might want to build your own Docker image, so you want, you want to specify exactly how it's going to run. Um, so on GitHub, we have uh, a tutorial application repository, github.com slash nimbix slash nds17. And that's this application repository here. You can see um, the NAE directory, which has the application metadata, um, scripts, uh, styles. So we're going to build up the application uh, to stylize an image now. So now we're going to actually pull this repository from GitHub and build the Docker image. Um, I'll show you the Docker file. This is the Docker file that we're going to build. Um, we have a special base image for today's uh, workshop, um, Jarvis Base NDS 17. That already has the neural style uh, and torch application built into it. Um, so we just need to build the Nimbix application, kind of productize it, and launch it as a workflow. Um, so basically what it does is it installs a couple of uh, packages. Uh, it adds the app depth, which I'll show you in a minute. It validates the app depth. This is useful to prevent builds from pushing uh, if, if the app depth is uh, invalid JSON or has some schema issues. Um, it adds a screenshot for metadata. It adds uh, some of our special scripts and some additional files that we need uh, for the workflow. So we're going to build this on Jarvis. So we create a new application. And if you're following along and um, you want to build this yourself, uh, you have to be able to push uh, a Docker image to Docker Hub. So you would need to put your own um, 
your own username here. So I'll show you how to log in to Docker Hub as well. So for today, uh, we'll, we'll use Jarvis NDS 17 tutorial. And the Git repository is git at github.com, Nimbix. And an app ID, NDS 17 tutorial. That creates our application icon. And now we can build and pull it. So build and pull means that it will actually build the Docker file. It'll pull the Git repository. It'll build the Docker image. And then it'll push it up to Docker Hub. And then it'll pull the image back down. So your image will be available on Docker Hub and it'll be able to run directly on Jarvis. Now, if you want to build here, you'll need to log into a Docker registry. Um, if you want to log into Docker Hub, that's the default. So you can log in here with a username and password. These are your Docker Hub credentials. So this takes a couple minutes to build. Um, I've already uh, built and pulled the image here. Uh, so that's the NDS 17 workshop image. So in a moment, it'll show the same uh, application icon, uh, application name. And you can see I've set a custom screenshot for the application. So a user would see the screenshot as a preview before they launch your application. So they have a sense of uh, what workflow they're actually going to be running. Um, I've built a simple command. I've turned echo into a simple workflow. So I can echo any message but I can only run echo as the command. So I no longer have to specify the specific command. Um, so you can imagine as, as, a, as a developer supporting your own application, uh, now you're not telling a user, oh, find this executable and run it in the path. You're telling them, just put your input in here and run the application exactly as I've designed it. So one uh, other thing I'd like to point out in the job history the standard output is written to this window as a preview and, and is available after the job as well. You can download it here, but the, the Hello Jarvis is written uh, to the output window. So our job should be running here and it's echoed Hello Jarvis. So um, at this point, we've built and pulled uh, an application from GitHub. Um, you can actually go look at the code uh, that, that uh, declares uh, what the application environment is going to be. Um, primarily, the, the main files uh, to look at are the Docker file and the app. Um, application metadata is defined in the Etsy and AE directory. So if you add files to that directory inside of the Docker image, um, they will affect the, uh, the application metadata on Jarvis. So I just want to show the uh, appdef real quick. So this is the appdef.json uh, that we've added. You can actually download this file from uh, the application icon. And we have a kind of a sensible set of defaults with batch server and GUI that you can base your appdef on. So basically, this has things like the application name, the description, author will be your username. Um, classification, so users can find them in our catalog. Uh, vault types are storage technologies, so we have a number of built-in storage technologies on Jarvis. Um, and then commands, these are where you define your main workflows. So to restrict the workflow to the command echo, uh, the, the command that I specify is echo, and then I add some parameters. I add a string parameter so that users can input a string parameter. And then I also restricted the, the machine types to just the N0 uh, for the default machines available in this application. So the N0 is a two core machine, whereas running Echo, you don't need a GPU, you don't need 16 cores. You want to run with the minimal hardware. I have some other commands here, and we'll go through these as we walk through the tutorial um, to understand what the trade offs and kind of what the uh, what the benefits of, of uh, designing commands in certain ways are. 
So the next step is really to customize your Docker file. Now you know how to pull any Docker image from a doc public Docker registry, and you know how to build uh, any application from GitHub, which is uh, where Docker images are derived from. Docker images are derived typically from Docker files. That's not the only way that they can be built, but that's a very common way and very easy way to build uh, Docker images. So um, when you customize your Docker file, you might want to inherit from some application that's already out there in, in the wild. Um, so if there's an application that, that you're interested in, uh, you might want to do a Docker search on or check Docker Hub to see if there's uh, kind of an application environment that you could start from and then wrap it into an application workflow that could run on the Argus. So some of our base images are uh, Ubuntu desktop, Ubuntu base, CentOS desktop, and base. So the desktop has kind of batteries included remote desktop capabilities in it. Um, you can connect directly from your browser into the remote desktop. So for today's work, workshop, um, we have a special base image, Jarvis base NDS 17. Um, this is a Docker file uh, that inherits uh, kind of an application uh, workflow, the, the uh, application binaries and dependencies that we need for today's workshop. Uh, so it's uh, very easy to um, to uh, just get started with the application metadata and understand how to build workflows, rather than uh, focus on uh, focus on how to uh, build the entire Docker file. So this is kind of simple. Is there any way to make the left window and not use the right and make that full screen? Sure. Is that better? That'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, what's already installed in it is uh, Torch, uh, which is a, a, a popular machine learning framework, and uh, NeuralStyle, uh, which is an application that's built on top of the Torch framework. Um, NeuralStyle is the application that styles images. Um, I didn't write it. Uh, it's an open source uh, application. So we're turning this into a, a workflow on Jarvis. <laughs> Okay, um, sorry, my internet uh, just cut out. So um, this is the Docker file, uh, base NDS 17. Um, so what am I doing in this file? I'm inheriting from the base image, which already has the application bits installed. Um, I'm installing some additional packages uh, using apt-get. So this is a, an Ubuntu flavored uh, uh, personality. Uh, so I install Pinta, which is a, a, a program for displaying an image and curl, uh, which is used for downloading, uh, kind of making web calls. And uh, then I add the application metadata. So the apta, copy uh, the screenshot into the image. So Etsy and AE is where the metadata should be stored. And then a script stylized, which wraps the command that we're going to run. So now we want to define the application workflow. We want the user to be able to run the command th, which is torch, neuralstyle.lua, which is the actual application script. It's a Lua is an interpreted language. Uh, dash style image, and then the input for the style, so that would be like starry night. And then the content image, which is uh, the, the Jarvis image uh, that I showed you, Jarvis standing on the Trinity River. So we need to define a command in the command section of the app that. We call it stylize. So we use our wrapper script, stylize, which will basically invoke this command. But it needs to take input from the, from the user. So we want to constrain the, 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 uh, the input. Um, so if there are any uh, Haskell users out there, you know that the uh, input is kind of where uh, programs uh, have the most errors. Um, so we want to constrain the input so that users can kind of give a finite set of, of potential inputs into the program. So we add two parameters, style image, uh, which is a file type. So we have uh, some primitive types for parameters, uh, like string, selection, file, uh, number. Uh, you can even have a slider, which is a range. Um, it's required, so every user has to give this input in order to launch the application. Uh, the name is the style image. Uh, these are mainly for uh, hints for the user, the name and description. 
And then a filter, so this is very simple, uh, kind of blob style filter uh, endings. So start up PNG and start up JPG are the only allowed uh, input types. So this file will actually allow users to select from the remote storage and launch the application with the files that they already have. And then same for content image. Allow them to pick any content image, um, which is a .png or .jpg in their storage. And then machine types, we want this to be able to run on a GPU. So in order to do that, we constrain that by saying machine types ng star. Now, in a moment, I'll explain why this is not good enough. We actually need to constrain this further. Uh, but for now, uh, we know that this is a GPU-powered application and will allow this to run on any GPU type. So then, in the Docker file, we add copy nae-appdev.json to etsy nae-appdev.json, and that puts it in the right place for Jarvis to detect. So uh, again, this is, this is kind of the full picture of the Docker file. Uh, the app depth is added on this line. And now uh, to the wrapper script, stylized.sh. So um, again, when building a workflow, we don't want users to have to worry about sourcing the right script to have the, the application executable in its environment. Um, we don't want to have to worry what the proper working directory is for the user. We want to take care of that. Um, and then we want to actually construct the right command for the user to run. So basically, we take this and we set up all the arguments so we know that it's going to be able to use CUDA, CUDNN, so we get some extra flags there. And we also specify the output location. You can make this more general uh, so that it's a random uh, file name. And then the, the uh, dollar sign, add sign, uh, that will uh, add the rest of the command arguments that come from the output. Uh, for this application. So then you have a very well-defined workflow uh, that can only be run in, in a few ways. And there's also uh, a lot of security benefits for that as well. So if you actually have proprietary code that you want to uh, allow the user to run, but you don't want to expose to the user, you don't want them to steal your bits, um, you can build a workflow where they don't have access to the environment, but they can run your algorithm, uh, which is, is um, really nice in the cloud. That's kind of one of the reasons that the API economy has, has flourished in, in many ways. So if you fork the GitHub repository, you can push your changes and then go back to uh, mc.jarvis.com and uh, rebuild the application. So I'm not sure if, um, if the web connection is working now. Uh, it seems like it's back. Um, so to rebuild the application, you would come back here to uh, Material Compute. And um, you can see now I have two application icons. Um, but to rebuild after you do a git push to GitHub, uh, just come back here and use the Nimbix build service uh, to rebuild the image. So this will rebuild the image and then re-pull it into Jarvis, uh, reflecting any changes in your Docker file. Now, one thing to mention um, in history, um, it tells you the status of the build, but sometimes your builds can fail. Um, and as a developer, you know, that can be really frustrating if you don't know why. Um, but uh, whenever a build fails, you'll get the complete uh, standard output of your build emailed to you, so you can check the, the actual detail from the Docker build um, of why it actually failed, and then you can go and fix uh, your Docker file if you, have any, uh, if you have anything that you need to change. So to show you the workflow, stylize an image. Uh, this is the workflow that we just built. Um, we can select a PNG file from our remote storage. Uh, so these are my uh, files on my remote storage. You can see I've been running this application already because um, I have the stylized images. Um, but we can stylize a, an image. Uh, this is actually the style image. Um, so that's actually kind of, um, you know, if, if I'm a user and I get this algorithm, uh, I'm really excited, so I want to take a picture of myself and make me look like Starry Night. Um, but I don't have the style image. You actually have to go and retrieve the style image. Um, and that's something that we want to guide the users to, to have available so that they can just run it uh, kind of turnkey. Um, so I actually have the Starry Night image here, um, and I can 
run the workflow. But if I didn't have Starry Night uh, already available in my user data, um, then I wouldn't be able to run it. So it's not very turnkey at this point. Um, but I can run it on any GPU type. That's the NG star. So M2090, K40, K80, uh, M40s. Um, we have other uh, GPUs. We also have P100s. Uh, but for this particular application, uh, these are the GPUs available. And you can imagine each of these has a different price. Uh, so maybe for a user, they don't care if it takes an hour uh, for the image to process. They just want the image back. Or you know, if it, even if it takes uh, a day, uh, you know, they just want to see the image at some point. But other users, uh, there's, there's kind of time value of data. So um, having answers now is more valuable than having answers tomorrow. Um, so they might be willing to pay for whatever the most expensive hardware is available at whatever scale is available. Um, so this is actually a, a choice that we leave up to the user, as long as your application supports it. So that, that's also a very nice feature of, um, of being able to run on Jarvis. So now we submit the application. So this will launch the job, runs it on demand. This is all serverless, so I haven't had to provision any servers. I built a Docker image, then I deployed it, and now I can run it on demand. I can actually also make a JSON call by submitting this as a post request, and it'll run exactly the same workflow. Um, so we have a, a, a very simple yet powerful API, um, and you can do arbitrary serverless workflows uh, in this way. Um, now, finally, uh, we want to restrict, uh, we kind of want to make this a batteries included workflow. Uh, so we add some uh, style images. We add a selection. We change the, the file input to a selection so the user can select from Starry Night, Picasso, or 8-Bit Jarvis. 8-Bit Jarvis is our, kind of our mascot. Um, so you can do this uh, with AppDev as well. Um, there's documentation on kind of all the features of the AppDev available. And, um, the workflow ends up being uh, better stylized. Uh, so now the user can just select uh, a type of style that they want to use, and then select their content image. So it's much more turnkey. Um, actually, you could take this even one step further. Um, some users might just want to input a URL. Um, so you can make your application support that. You could just curl the image down, and then process on that, and then save that somewhere, or maybe deposit it somewhere. So there's lots of different ideas for different workflows that you can build. Uh, the sky's the limit. Um, and, and it's really up to developers to kind of take this in and do useful things with it. So um, finally, um, the last step of building an application is actually shipping it, uh, releasing it. So once your application has all the proper metadata set, has an app depth with well-defined workflows, a screenshot, you can add some help. Uh, help.html, you can set categories. Once you do all of these things, we can actually release the applications on our app store. Um, so we can release them as community applications or as uh, kind of um, uh, partnerships, managed partnerships. Um, so releasing on Jarvis, you have different monetization options as well. Um, you can do a pass-through license upload cost, which is basically money in your pocket proportional to the utilization by your end users. So, um, if you ship an application and you have a lot of users coming to Jarvis to use it, um, you can actually get a, a portion of the uplift as kind of a, a, an app royalty to you. Um, and it, it applies proportionally to the number of uh, CPU cores. And then finally, we have uh, community versus certified apps. So community apps uh, can be contributed by, um, by uh, anyone. And then certified apps um, can also be uh, uh, kind of certified on Nimbix with uh, additional support. And usually there's a, a business agreement there as well. So finally, some best, best practices. Uh, we have remote visualization applications, Paraview, Kenu Pipeline, Power AI, and Digits. These are on GitHub just to take uh, a look at what applications are available um, and kind of design patterns uh, that we've been using here at Nimbix. And then finally, um, some useful links. Um, if you're, you're following along on the slides, uh, these links are uh, tutorials, uh, kind of uh, different uh, pieces of documentation to help you design applications. So, any questions?
Hey, uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, uh, is there a programmatic or an API way of launching these workflows or these servers? Yes. Uh, so if you go to uh, the portal and you take a look at, uh, if you click the task builder, we actually have the API call prepared as a preview submission. So you can literally copy and paste this JSON and then you can curl host to api.jarvis.com slash jarvis slash submit. And that will launch the, the job exactly as you say. And you can change machine type or nodes. Uh, so you, you can really integrate in any way that you need to uh, with the API. Um, there's also a CLI, uh, Jarvis CLI on GitHub. Uh, so if you just want to, to kind of interact with it on the command line, you can do that as well. Steve, if you don't mind, let me add that. So the best practice for constructing the API call is having the portal do it and then just copying that versus trying to, because the app that actually restricts each one, the portal enforces it. So the easiest thing to do is to just kind of walk through what you want to do with the portal and then copy and paste it into an API call. Anyone else? step-by-step physically -step for power, so kind of all the way where you don't even have the machine architecture to build this stuff on, yeah. on your own, right? So that's, so we'll have it, I mean, that's coming very soon. But we also have the, the workflow deployment guide that Stephen has up there has an actual uh, tutorial um, that um, right now it uses Docker Hub for builds, so it's an Intel only, but, um, but we, we're going to continue to evolve that content. Yeah, so at a high level, um, I, I don't want to take up too much time because we have other speakers, but um, we use so we, we, we use Docker to actually ingest the code because it's a it's a very standard way to package code. But the container engine that we run is actually proprietary. It's our own container engine, and it's a high it's designed for high performance computing. So it does things like optimize the storage layer. So where Docker typically runs off of an overlay file system or an AUFS or whatever, where you have to actually cache all that stuff first. Ours is actually hooked up to live distributed block storage underneath, and it's InfiniBand attached. And there's no, you know, so one thing that you notice immediately is that um, applications start up instantly because they're they're live. They're not they don't have to be cached first. And then of course because we're not using those extra layers of overlays and so forth, the actual I/O performance is better in the application. And then we've also done other things like on security, around uh, you know, access to accelerated hardware, and so forth. That you know, Docker, the Docker runtime has made a lot of progress, specifically in the last few months. But you know, what it was the end of 2013 when we launched our container engine? Um, Docker was unusable for pretty much anything, right? So we had to build all this stuff ourselves, right? So it's really, really designed for, for high performance workloads. But I, you know, I could probably talk about it for eight hours. So, uh, <laughs> but we'd be happy to, to follow up. Sure, so can I answer that one too? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, yes, there's a, there's a preload step, so there's a number of ways to get the data in. You can use, we have an actual interactive file manager that attaches, uh, Stephen may, might have mentioned storage vaults during the presentation. Uh, there's different types of storage vaults, so by default, every user gets one terabyte of free storage, which is file storage. Uh, it's really optimized for simulation and those types of workflows where it's, it's kind of smaller data sets. Uh, 
But if you're looking for like you know, 20 terabytes of data, we have, we have distributed block storage data sets that you can attach in the same way. And one of our, um, uh, you know, one, of, one of our pieces of IP is actually an abstraction layer which presents all that as a storage to the application. So you don't have to modify the code to access it, but we give you, you know, kind of an interactive way to get the data in. Um, you could also use our sync and all that stuff. Uh, we don't have something right now that's like part of the actual API called to upload 20 terabytes of data. That would be kind of crazy today, uh, but maybe in 10 years, that's pretty normal. Uh, but what we find users typically doing is they actually pre-stage their data set using, using the ingest technologies that we have, and then they just run the code the data. As, as you saw, Stephen selected the files. That was actually in his cloud storage. So I don't know if that fully answers your question. But Yes, well, simulation is like the opposite of machine learning, right? If you take in like you know a gigabyte of data and you produce you know a terabyte of data, so in that case, what happens is that gets stored in the cloud and you download it, or even better, you visualize it. You actually do all your entire workload in the cloud, so you don't have to move data around. Uh, but it's available to you in your cloud drive, and you can download that using using different technologies. So, what else? All right, thank you, Stephen. Well done.